Dr. Cecilia Rakusek, the president and CEO of our National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It's such a pleasure for me to be part of this important webinar and important event that really talks about principles that were foundational in our museum's founding. Those principles of immigration, citizenship, and the impact of a women's movement. It is important to me as a fourth generation Czechoslovak to um, understand and to also really tell us and tell you about the importance of immigration in a global society. You know, it, I know that my ancestors uh, who came over in the late 1800s were instrumental in fighting for the principles of democracy and freedom. And we as women, my great great grandmother and others, had to work very hard in a different work environment. Today in the 21st century, we have many doors open to us, but we still have many doors to open. And I think it's important for all of us as citizens of a global society to look at immigration in the context of the 20th century, in the context of the 21st century, and to realize that although the things around us may have changed, the importance of understanding immigration the importance of citizenship and belonging to a country and the importance that women play in a global society are more important now than ever before. I wanna welcome you to this important event and hope that this will just be the first step in a series of dialogues and in a series of conversations that we can have about the importance of democracy in a global society. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Holly Hotchner. I'm the president and CEO of the National Women's History Museum. I want to begin by thanking Teresa Stenstrup at the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library, as well as Pivotal Ventures, Hirsch Blackwell, and Jeanette Sharp for their generous support that helped underwrite the Determined to Rise series. We're so pleased to share with you our final presentation and culmination of this series, The Influence of Immigration and Citizenship Rights on the Women's Suffrage Movement. What started off as a traveling series is now being delivered virtually, and we're pleased to bring this program directly to your home today. I wanted to begin by telling you a little bit about where we're headed as an institution and what we're doing as we adjust to the new normal of COVID-19. As you know, there's no comprehensive women's history museum in North America. We have a museum for stamps, the spoken word, posters, buildings, and even the museum of sex, but nothing for women and we're half of the population. What keeps us going every day is our core belief that there's an urgency to tell women's stories and share women's history because women have been largely excluded from the history books. There's a saying that every time a young girl opens a history book and doesn't see women represented, she learns that she is worth less. So we're here to change that. As we work to open the doors to our first physical location in Washington, DC in the coming years, we're also continuing the important work of bringing women's history to life through learning resources, programs, and events. We recognize the vital role we play as the leading resource for women's history, and we take this responsibility very seriously. Over the last several months, we've developed new programming for at-home learning and educating, launched a coronavirus journaling project to capture women's stories during COVID-19, celebrated the centennial of the 19th Amendment with a robust series of programming, and launched a voter registration engagement initiative to honor all of the women on whose shoulders we stand who help secure the women's right to vote. I encourage you to check our website, follow us on social media, and sign up to become a member by visiting us at womenshistory.org. We think of you all as kindred spirits, and we hope you'll join us in the critical work of sharing women's stories and ampl amplifying women's voices. Thanks again for joining us today, and thanks to the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library and to all of today's panelists. We hope you enjoy this important conversation. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Therese Grant, President of the League of Women Voters of Iowa, where she has served on their board since 2014. 
Therese also served as president of the local Grinnell League of Women Voters from 2014 to 2020. As a former French teacher, Therese taught for over 30 years in public and private schools in Iowa and New Jersey. She also taught internationally in China and the Ukraine. We're delighted to have her today as our moderator. Hello, I'm very honored to be here today as moderator of a panel discussion, which is part of a series determined to rise. We are privileged to have three outstanding women as our panelists, and they are Dr. Karen Kodrowski, who is director of the Carrie Chapman Katz Center for Women and Politics and professor of political science at Iowa State University. The Katz Center conducts research on women and politics and promotes civic engagement. In addition to her duties at the Katz Center, Karen teaches courses in American politics and conducts research on women in American politics and civil engagement. Dr. Sarah Eggy is a Claude D. Pottinger Professor of History at Center College in Kentucky, where she teaches a variety of courses on women's and gender history, food and environment history, and post-Civil War U.S. history. Her scholarship and teaching on the history of citizenship, voting rights, gender and, gender and immigration has won her a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And Dr. Kelly Kosk is an assistant professor of history at Oklahoma State University. Her research and teaching centers on the ways indigenous women and their communities conceived of citizenship and indigenous national sovereignty. She is also interested in the inception of various interracial women's advocacy networks in early America. And with that, we will begin our questioning. First, to begin, Karen, can you please explain to us who was actually given the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment 100 years ago? Thank you, Therese, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, one of the common myths that I have heard through this last year is that um, the 19th Amendment only enfranchised white women. That is not actually true. The 19th Amendment enfranchised all women who were considered citizens of the United States, and this included African American women who lived outside the Deep South. And even in 1920, there were some women in South Carolina, African American women in South Carolina and in Florida, who managed to register and to vote in the 1920 presidential election. The 19th Amendment also applied to all Native American women who were citizens of the United States, which at the time required them to renounce their tribal citizenship. That barrier uh, was raised or eliminated in 1924 with the passage of the Snyder Act, which declared that all Native Americans, whether they renounced their tribal citizenship or not, were American citizens. Uh, the 19th Amendment, however, did not eliminate other kinds of state imposed or federally imposed barriers that might have impacted women, especially in communities of color. So Chinese women, for example, even if they were born in the United States and should have had birthright citizenship, Chinese Americans were not considered citizens and therefore Chinese American women would not have been allowed to vote. It did not apply to women in Puerto Rico, for example. And it certainly did not apply uh, to African American women who lived within the Deep South who faced um, a, a wide variety of barriers to voting under Jim Crow legislation. Uh, so this really calls into question about who is considered a citizen and exactly what rights of citizenship did people hold. Thank you. And now to Callie. What have historians and the scholars left out about the story of the suffrage movement. Thank you. Uh, well, as you know, the suffrage movement and the narrative of the women's suffrage movement is really dominated by the stories of middle-class white women. And that isn't a coincidence. It was really made to be that way. Um, white women really were responsible for writing that narrative themselves. And in that process, they often wrote out the contributions of women of color. And what we find um, once we dig into these other women who contributed to the movement, we find that the movement was not at all monolithic 
and that suffrage and citizenship meant very different things to women from different communities. Um, and so scholars have um, done a good job lately in the last several years of really going back to these communities, indigenous communities, immigrant communities, African-American communities, and try to dig up these and resurrect these stories of these women who not only shaped the suffrage movement, um, but did so in order to help their own communities as well. Thank you. And now what should we know about the suffrage movement in the Midwest? Sarah, could you answer that one, please? Sure. Um, so just like Callie said, leaders of the National Women's Suffrage Movement sought to obscure or eliminate from the record. And women in the Midwest, um, that actually was something that they purposely ignored or downplayed. And in part because um, the Midwest had a very interesting con context. Um, there were immigrants that had recently come to the United States after the Civil War, especially. Um, and then there were also white settler colonists moving into the Midwest and settling it as well. What this meant is that there was a lack of infrastructure. There were very few railroads, although they were coming by the end of the 19th century. Um, roads were treacherous. Um, there were not cities. There were just small hamlets and towns. Um, this was pretty dirty. This was pretty difficult. And so that meant that mounting successful suffrage campaigns was incredibly difficult. And these suffragists knew this. It doesn't mean that they didn't try. Um, they went to great lengths. And in fact, the tenacity that they displayed is pretty profound. It's pretty interesting. Um, so despite the fact that they didn't have railroads, they uh, managed to find um, locations and, and get to locations using buggies. Um, a lot of suffragists rode on horseback. Um, and so we can see that um, suffragists used what they had um, and accepted a lot of the barriers. Um, they often relied on state and local activists as well, enlisting them. Um, it was not necessarily Susan B. Anthony who was riding on horseback, but they could find advocates locally who had those resources. Um, but those campaigns were very difficult. Um, even though they really tried hard, um, they lacked funds. Um, the finances of the movement were always in short supply. Um, and so that was always a, a great difficulty. Um, there were also prejudices against this population that was growing in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. As I mentioned, there were lots of immigrants um, and many of the suffragists felt that they were backward and ignorant and that they would always be fundamentally opposed to women's suffrage. Um, and in fact, their writing proves this. Um, the leaders called the campaigns, especially in South Dakota in 1890 and 1898, murderous and a fiasco. And that's in the official record, right? So a lot of the testimonies, a lot of the angles that the suffragists used to describe these campaigns, even though they were quite tenacious, um, really downplay the importance of the Midwest. Um, the final thing I would say is that the Midwest really was a proving grounds. It was really field school because there were so many early campaigns, as I mentioned, 1890 in South Dakota and 1898, um, but there were other local campaigns. Iowa had a very robust grassroots um, effort in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So this is where really suffragists cut their teeth, so to speak. Um, and it's often downplayed or overlooked, uh, again, not only by the suffragists, but also by scholars who fail to understand the importance of the Midwest into this story of women's suffrage. And back to you, Karen. What were the qualifications for voting in the early 20th century? Thanks, Therese. That's a great question. Um, and the, I think it's important to back up a little bit farther and realize that the Constitution, as it was written in 1787, doesn't really say much about voters. It really leaves the definition of who can vote or what the qualifications are for voting up to the states under the time, place, and manner uh, clause of the, the Constitution. So by the time we get to the 1840s, when the, the suffrage movement is, is at, a, you know, at its time of birth through 1920, is that there is a national consensus that, that, there, that women of a certain social class deserve to be voters because they compare favorably in terms of literacy and sophistication and understanding the American political process compared to some men who had the right to vote. Um, and that includes Native American men and that includes African American men <laughs> uh, and it includes uh, immigrant men who um, might not have been 
might not be literate, might not be schooled in American civics and American political history. And, you know, even suffrage advocates who agree that these communities of men should have the right to vote, they also still pushed this forward to say that education should be um, an expectation or even a criteria for voting. And of course, in the American South, the use of literacy tests took that to an extreme. And this notion that, that voters needed to be literate, they were given very um, difficult or even impossible to answer questions and literacy tests were used as a way of disenfranchising voters. But on, on the other side of the coin, Carrie Chapman Catt, who is an Iowan who came to national prominence as a suffrage, suffragist um, and founded the League of Women Voters. She founded the League of Women Voters in order to educate voters about the public issues of the day, because she firmly believed that what you needed were informed voters, but she would not have been um, enthusiastically in favor of, of what happened in other parts of the country using this notion of literacy as a barrier to voting. And Sarah, can you tell us what is the relationship between voting, citizenship, and immigration? And how did they inform and transform the debate around women's suffrage, particularly in the American Midwest? So um, at the sort of base level here, this is really a state by state matter, right? States could enfranchise people. Um, so when it comes to immigration, as Karen said, immigrants could be part of this group. But I think it's important to think about the naturalization process. Oftentimes people assumed that the right to vote followed the completion of the naturalization process, which at the time was supposed to be a five year process. Um, and in year two, you would take out what's called a declaration of intention. Um, and that would basically show that you uh, intended to finish the naturalization process, get your certificate of citizenship and become a citizen. But because states gave people the right to vote, states could also determine when in that naturalization process the right to vote could be bestowed. And so in many states in the Midwest, actually many states nationally, but the Midwest had a number of these states, um, immigrants got the right to vote before they became naturalized citizens after they took out that declaration of attention in year two. And so this pro produces a really fascinating dynamic in the Midwest where you have suffragists who are native born, right? They have birthright citizenship and they can't vote, right? They are women and that is the barrier that they must surmount. And then they live alongside increasing populations of immigrants who will take out their declarations of intentions after again, about two years and they can vote and they're not citizens. This produces a paradox that is pretty unique to the Midwest. Again, lots of states have this declarant suffrage or another word for it is alien suffrage. But um, in the Midwest, it's this potent mix of the power that immigrants have because for two reasons, they have large populations in the Midwest, especially in the late 19th century. Um, and they often operate within political parties as pressure groups, either through the Farmers Alliance or the Knights of Later, which later combined in a number of states to become the populist party Party, which was one of the most significant third party options in American history. So they have political power in numbers um, and they pose a threat. And this becomes really important. It sort of simmers slowly um, over the course of the 19th and early 20th century where people are not quite um, sure about these immigrant non-citizen voters, but really it's World War I that makes this issue so important. Um, what starts to happen is you see calls for um, the, constri uh, the constriction of voting rights um, to keep it within this completion of the naturalization process. Um, and if you're thinking about World War I here, um, really the target are Germans and German Americans, and they are the number one immigrant group in the Midwest. They have a lot of power in numbers, um, and increasingly they are seen as the enemy, both abroad and at home. And you see suffragists using this context to their favor, arguing that these German immigrants are not, not only going to commit sabotage abroad or they're going to commit acts of sabotage, but they're also going to commit electoral sabotage. And they're accusing Germans in particular, but really immigrants broadly, they're not necessarily making distinctions among immigrants, 
of torpedoing women's suffrage amendments because they're arguing that women's suffrage is uh, to preserve democracy and to uphold the values of citizenship, which uh, American women with birthright citizenship are proclaiming. And so you see in the suffrage literature accusations of voter fraud, which we hear lots about. But in this context, it was really a nativist attack leveled on these German immigrants meant to propel the women's suffrage movement forward in the Midwest. And I have to add, it worked. Um, in most cases in the Midwest, um, not only were these Midwestern states some of the first to either enact presidential suffrage toward the end of World War I, I'm thinking of Minnesota, um, there are other uh, actions in Ohio and Michigan, um, but also in South Dakota in 1918, this was an express part of the rhetoric. And in fact, the governor of South Dakota actually amends the woman's suffrage uh, amendment to include a clause to disenfranchise these alien voters, these, these non-citizen voters. Um, and it works, it's, it's a, an incredibly important amendment. They don't even call it the, the woman's suffrage amendment anymore. They call it the citizenship amendment or the Americanization uh, amendment. And so it's a, an incredible, incredibly powerful example of the intersection of immigration and citizenship and the question of voting rights and who it ought to vote. Um, and the words they start to use are who is fit to vote and using that standard of fitness, I think is a really important way of thinking about um, how the women's suffrage movement in the Midwest and, and nationally connects with lots of discourses about politics and democracy and participation at this time. And Karen, would you like to follow up and could you add more to how this affected various populations of women living in this country at that time? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I think one of the things to remember that even in the Midwest, there were a, 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 there was a diverse coalition of women who were involved with suffrage, uh, and and here in Iowa, which you know the stereotype of Iowa is that it's overwhelmingly white and there's you know no no people of color. What we actually see is that there were a number of African Americans who were involved um, who were involved in the suffrage movement. And that mirrors what was going on nationally, where first, you know, it grew out of the abolition movement, um, those who had escaped slavery or were otherwise involved with the abolition. Uh, but then also later, it was part of a, a larger civil rights movement. So we saw that that uh, African American women were part of the club women, club women's colored club women's movement, um, and uh, you know at the turn of the century, and we're also advocating for civil rights generally, and saw women's suffrage as one way to be able to promote African American civil rights more generally, and uh, and there were a number of African American women in Iowa who rose to prominence as suffragists, and so it really shows that the the Midwest is not just white people and farmers, that there's a lot more going on here. Um, as Sarah's description also says that it's it's really a very interesting uh, group. And it's been largely overlooked until recently. Yeah, I think that Karen brings up an excellent point about the role of African American women in the Midwest. And scholars are doing great work to undercover um, their contributions. Um, I think that actually raises an even uh, more important point or broad framework that even among white women, right, ethnicity, um, the ideas, the different reforms, the different activisms that they expressed uh, meant that they didn't necessarily come at women's suffrage from this sort of similar path or a unified, unified political framework. Um, many of the suffragists, that, uh, and especially um, in these small Midwestern towns, came through, came at the movement through temperance. Um, or the Federated Women's Club. And so they were not necessarily interested in the right to vote sort of uh, purely without other influences. They had many different influences and they saw the right to vote as an extension of their civic activism or their civic engagement. Um, and so that put them in line with this sense that they're citizens acting in their communities on behalf of their communities, however they wanted to find that means that we, we need to really take account of this complexity of activisms. Um, oftentimes the suffragists themselves really try to push this as a single issue that we're really only caring about the right to vote. And we're going to bring all these diverse women to come together. They might say that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these women just erase these other parts of their identities. And I think the Midwest really highlights just how diverse this movement truly was. Thank you. And you 
mentioned quite a bit about uh, the different types of activism that women were involved in at that particular time, depending on their own background and beliefs. Uh, do you have any more to add to that, Sarah? Oh, sure, I do. Um, yeah, so women in the Midwest, primarily, one of the biggest ways they got involved, as I mentioned, was temperance. And really, it was through the WCTU, or the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which was founded in the Midwest. Some of the first meetings were in Ohio. Um, the founders are from Wisconsin, Francis Willard, one of those. And so they really see the right to vote, especially as they're forming in the early 19th century, or the, and by the late 19th century, they are arguing explicitly that they want the, to write the, the right to vote to end the rum power, as they say it. Um, and they are not afraid to bring these two things together. That, of course, frustrates women in the national organizations who want this to be a single issue. It gets so bad that in South Dakota, the same executive core for the WCTU is this is operating as the suffrage association, um, and which infuriates the national leaders. In fact, to the extent that in 1898, they basically tell the suffragists in South Dakota, we're not going to help you with your campaign. And the women in South Dakota had to run it themselves, which is pretty amazing. Um, they give a little bit of support, they give some advice, but it's, it's mostly run by what they call home talent. So temperance was incredibly important. And if you think about the presence of immigrants, especially German, lots of Scandinavian immigrants, many of these immigrant cultures, they cherish the right to vote or the right to drink um, and have alcohol consumption um, as part of their cust customs and their cultural norms. So this is another way where we can see suffragists get so frustrated with temperance because they argue that these immigrant voters are never going to support women's suffrage, not only because they're in ignorant and backward, right, that's code for the sort of uneducated ideas that Karen was talking about, but also because they are never going to move away from this position of being against prohibition. And so this all also um, really causes some problems uh, in terms of the broader movement and how they strategize the Midwest. But there are other activisms that women in the Midwest in, um, really take up. Um, in particular, the Federated Women's Club, this is another really important avenue, lots of local clubs in the Midwest. Um, and they had a diverse array of reforms that they promoted and anything from sanitation to education and literacy. They brought in traveling libraries. Um, these women are of municipal authorities and city leaders. They often take those roles, city beautification. They're often um, planting trees. They're buying lots in parks, or in abandoned lots and, and building public parks. They're starting some of the first birth registration programs in local hospitals where there were no birth registration programs. So these women are then seeing the right to vote again as an extension of their work in their communities as a matter of civic engagement to improve the lives of their neighbors and friends. And so again, like, it's coming through these different organizations. It's definitely a, a collective activism, but it nevertheless showcases the different ways that women approach women's suffrage. And they were unabashed. They were not going to necessarily keep or tamp down um, those issues that they really wanted to see happen. And now you, Callie, what about activism for indigenous women? How did that compare and how did it perhaps differ? So activism for Indigenous women was quite different, actually. I mean, a lot of this conversation so far has to do with um, citizenship and voting rights. Um, for Indigenous people, though, citizenship did not necessarily mean more rights. And there were a lot of Indigenous people who were not interested in getting U.S. citizenship. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one of the main reasons, um, and Karen had actually alluded to this before, um, after the passage of the 14th Amendment, indigenous men who were US citizens could vote. But if you were a US citizen as an indigenous person, that meant that you had to disassociate yourself with your tribe, any tribes that widely gained uh, citizenship in this period and the right to vote, um, did so at the expense of their communities. Um, and what that meant was to disassociate yourself from your tribe was to reject values of communalism, it was to reject indigenous forms of governance, which often included women's participation. And in fact, uh, women often played a very important role in tribal councils. Um, so that had to go away if that were to, if voting rights and citizenship were to take place. Um, and so particularly for indigenous women, 
um, citizenship was not necessarily seen as something desirable. Um, and the at the point where Indigenous women like uh, Gertrude Bonin, who was a Lakota, or excuse me, a Dakota um, woman, she's probably the most famous of the Indigenous women who actually were part of the suffrage movement. Um, she advocated for women's suffrage, but to a different end. It was to actually get more power for her community and for Indian communities more broadly. Um, they were interested in protecting indigenous sovereignty because as um, tribal nations um, sort of were pressured to disband and become US citizens, um, that meant that they had less control over their communities. And in fact, the federal government was actively trying to destroy indigenous communities um, through boarding schools, which um, a lot of um, suffragists were definitely a part of these civilization programs that were aimed at um, civilizing indigenous peoples and bringing them into modernity. Um, so, you know, through this process of gaining citizenship and the right to vote, um, Indian peoples were expected to give up anything about their past, their culture, their religion, their values. Um, and so, you know, this you know, Indigenous women's activism was about so much more than citizenship. Sometimes it was about not having citizenship for other women. Uh, they argued for layered citizenships, which is this idea that Indigenous women and men should be citizens of the United States and should have voting rights at the federal level, but they should also be able to retain rights to govern their own communities the way they saw fit. Um, because once, uh, you know, tribes get abolished, then they lose control of their land, their land gets broken up and parceled out in the allotment process, um, and they just lose control over their communities. Um, so it was a very different sort of struggle um, for Indigenous women than it was um, for other women within the suffrage movement. And to keep going with, with the um, topic of Indigenous uh, women, could you talk more about the relationship that existed between the Quakers and the Indigenous women in the suffrage movement? Yes, absolutely. Um, so Quakers and Indigenous women had a sort of complicated relationship. Um, one thing, and I'll speak more broadly for a moment about suffragists, not just Quakers, um, but one thing that suffragists had a habit of doing was pointing to other cultures, um, mainly indigenous cultures, um, and pointing to, uh, for instance, the Chinese Revolution in 1911, um, pointing to these gains or longstanding traditions of women's political participation, um, celebrating those, holding them up on a pedestal, um, and saying, look, um, these people, here are examples of other systems that include women. But at the same time, also using those examples to kind of denigrate other races, because the way those stories were often deployed um, was in a way to shame white men and say, you know, look at this example. These indigenous people who the implication is we all know are less civilized or are savage um, and the Chinese who the implication, again, was that they weren't as civilized as white Americans. Um, if they are able to do this, why can't white men get on board with this? Um, so there was a way, there was a, an awkward sense of um, sort of celebrating and holding these women up on a pedestal while at the same time kind of denigrating their race. And um, a lot of women's historians in the last uh, couple of decades have really held up this particular example in the late 19th century of um, Quaker women, particularly um, like Lucretia Mott and uh, Matilda Gage, and looked at how their relationships with Haudenosaunee women in upstate New York really influenced their activism. And the argument there is that they saw the power of clan mothers who had the ability to choose leaders within their clans, um, to be consulted in important decision-making, um, and that they use that as an example um, as to how women in the American uh, population could be consulted um, and could really have some sort of political power. Um, 
Now, the problem with this, and, and I will say too, that a lot of those Quaker women did come out and criticize colonization and did point out how colonization ended up eroding indigenous women's power within their communities, which was absolutely true. The problem here is that Quaker women were very much a part of these reform efforts that aimed at sort of civilizing Indian peoples. Um, and they often did not stand up very firm as good allies when it came to the dispossession of Indians from their land. Um, and this is particularly the case um, if we go take the story back actually even further. Um, so often historians will point to kind of the later half of the 19th century and these relationships that developed among Haudenosaunee women and suffragists in New York. Um, but the story actually has an earlier precedent at the beginning of the 19th century um, where um, Quaker women were assisting one particular group of um, of indigenous women uh, known as the Stockbridge Mohican women. Um, they were assisting them in opening up their own schools to teach both um, Mohican education and Anglo style education in order for Indian girls to become literate um, and literate in the English language, I should say. Um, but what's interesting about this process is that, you know, these Quaker women helped these Mohican women open up these schools um, in the process, they gained a seat for themselves on a prestigious committee uh, known as the Indian Committee for the Society of Friends. Um, they used this to really increase their participation in the public sphere and elevate their status. Um, but at the same time, when it came time to actually help Mohican women defend their land rights, in the state of New York, the Quaker women were quite silent um, and they really didn't step in as good allies. Um, they were only allies in the sense that they were helping Indian women gain more civilization and education as they would have seen it. Um, so the relationship um, was incredibly complicated um, and really shouldn't be seen as just um, you know, uh, Quaker women loved Indian women and Indian women loved Quaker women and they all helped each other and it was a big happy love fest. Um, there was certainly contention there and problems um, with Quaker interactions with indigenous peoples. Okay, thank you. Karen, um, we've heard uh, somewhat some information about relationships between Quakers and indigenous women. What about uh, white women and African-Americans? What was the relationship going on then? Yeah. Great question. And I guess the short answer is really complicated. Uh, so uh, in terms of the suffragists, uh, they worked alongside and in kind of an uncomfortable partnership with African-American women. Uh, now, notably from the very beginning of the suffrage movement in the 18. 40s, uh, African American women involved were involved, and some of the most prominent suffragists who were also abolitionists and spoke about those two as kind of conjoined and and um, you know a hand in glove sort of social movements include Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, and Harriet Tubman. You know we think about Harriet Tubman, and rightfully so, as the woman who brought so many slaves to freedom through the Underground Railroad, but especially after the Civil War, she became a very ardent suffragist. Um, Frederick Douglass, of course, played an extraordinarily important role at the Seneca Falls Convention, where it was his oratory and his persuasive speech that actually led to the suffrage plank being included in the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments. Because even amongst the people who were gathered at this event to discuss women's rights, the notion that women should, have, should be allowed to vote and have the vote was so contentious that it nearly uh, went down in defeat. By the time we get to the turn of the 20th century um, and we see the organization of African-American club women, um, many of those organizations seek to join the National American Associ Women's Suffrage Association, which was this large national organization um, led by, in much of this time by Carrie Chapman Catt and individual organizations would join this sort of national federation. Um, and uh, African-American groups were allowed to, to join. 
um, mostly. <laughs> and uh, But in the um, South, each state that was an affiliate was allowed to determine who its membership could be. So in the American South, Af the organizations were all white and many suffragists espoused, espoused white supremacy. Um, and they saw suffrage in the American South as a way of upholding white supremacy. Uh, because there would be so many more white voters who would be there to counteract the African American voters and vote in what they saw as their interest, which was, of course, to maintain political power. Interestingly enough, white supremacy was also the reason that a lot of people in the American South opposed suffrage, uh, because because the 19th Amendment very clearly was going to enfranchise women irrespective of race, they argued that African American women would turn out in large numbers and this would threaten white supremacy. And while today we are very accustomed to, um, to sort of coded language about race, um, there was no coded language in the 1900s. Um, it, was, it was very much sort of out there and, and in really frank terms. So, for example, some of the anti-suffragists would say, uh, we oppose women's suffrage because it'll enfranchise Black women, and we know how to keep Black men from voting. You know, we'll just go ahead and beat them up or threaten their lives or worry, you know, threaten lynching. Uh, but, you know, Black, white men might be too gallant to want to beat up women, even if they are black women. So therefore, we don't want women to be enfranchised at all, because they worried that it would be harder to intimidate black women with violence to keep them from the polls. Um, and of course, some of these sentiments are echoed throughout the country, of course, that racism is not exclusive to the American South. Another point that I'd like to make, if I may, um, you know, about how the Midwest is both different but also mirrors what happens in suffrage uh, more broadly. Um, we know about suffrage parades in New York City and in Washington, D.C., but I think one of the more interesting things is that here in Iowa was, was home to one of the first suffrage parades that happened in the country, and that was in 1908 in the town of Boone. And, and so as early as 1908, and this is, of course, you know, almost almost 10 years before the suffrage amendment is passed. It's uh, five or eight years before the, the suffrage parades that are more famous in DC and New York. Women were using their bodies. They were using their physical presence to show their support for this, which made it very hard to, to argue that women didn't really want suffrage when they're showing up in numbers to march through the streets. And then later in Iowa, we see that earlier in Iowa, um, Anna Heslett Jenks actually funded a, a, a parade or a, a, um, a donkey um, a wagon that went on the White Pole Road, which is one of the major um, thoroughfares in Western Iowa at the time to, to campaign for suffrage at every hamlet along the way. And towards the end of the suffrage uh, effort, we see that actually suffragists are engaging in automobile tours across the entire state of Iowa. So these parades and the, the uses of new technology were as prevalent in Iowa as they were elsewhere. Well, now I'm going to ask each of you to tell us about some of the lesser known women who fought for the right to vote. And I'm going to start with Callie. Would you like to begin, please? Sure. Um, so there were actually lots of Indigenous women we could talk about from the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and again, not all of them were necessarily advocating the right to vote. Um, Sarah Winnemucca, for instance, um, a Paiute woman, was more interested in raising awareness about violence against Indigenous women. Um, as I mentioned before, Gertrude Bonin was perhaps the most famous Indigenous woman who actually really did engage in the mainstream suffrage movement as well. And she really used um, her Indianness um, to her advantage. And she kind of used these stereotypes about Native peoples um, to attract people to her gatherings. And um, white suffragists loved this too, uh, because 
if somebody knew that, you know, an Indian was going to be at this um, suffrage meeting um, or at this parade or whatever it was, um, that more people would attend and the media would come out. And Gertrude, ba Gertrude Bonin would come dressed in her indigenous regalia, um, but instead of giving them a what they expected to be an Indian performance of this um, sort of ancient past, uh, she spoke to them about contemporary issues that affected indigenous people um, and how important it was for women and for indigenous people in general to have citizenship and have the right to vote. Um, and so she did help the women's suffrage movement in general. And then she also turned that activism into movement to help get the uh, Citizenship Act for Indian Peoples passed in 1824. Um, so she was really working through both of those movements. Um, but if I can, I wanna go back even further um, just to give an example of how indigenous women's activism has such deep roots um, in American history. And for that, I'd like to illuminate the story um, of Mary Peters, who was a Stockbridge Mohican woman. And she was um, one of these young girls who were educated in Quaker homes, but it wasn't that the Quakers were acting or asking to educate Indian girls in the 1790s, which is when she got her education in a Quaker home. Um, it was actually Mary Peters' Um, mother and her aunts, who were really the clan mothers of their community at the time, building and uh, sustaining this alliance with Quaker women. Um, they wrote Quaker women letters, um, said that they felt like they were sisters in the Lord, really cultivating this relationship um, and telling Quaker women what they wanted to hear, which is that you know, we, we have attained civilization, we want to further that, um, but their goal was always to maintain their community first and foremost. Um, so Mary Peters was part of this generation of Mohican girls who received both a Mohican education and an Anglo education in Quaker homes. And she was the one who really opened a lot of these schools for indigenous children in upstate New York with the financial assistance of Quakers. Um, but as I mentioned before, when the pressure to sell their land and the pressure to remove from New York became really intense, uh, the Quakers weren't really there to help them. And Mary Peters, what she had to do when the decision was made by her community to go ahead and sell what land they could to remove to Wisconsin, uh, Mary Peters stepped in and acted as an attorney to her tribe uh, in order to negotiate a fair price for land dealings with the state of New York. And so this is in 1820. So you have an indigenous women um, traveling between upstate New York and Albany, um, negotiating land prices uh, with male counselors from her tribe as well. Um, and so these are really remarkable things that indigenous women are doing and advocating for their communities. And this also comes back into the citizenship question because once the Stockbridge Mohicans get to Wisconsin, um, the Indian Removal Act had been passed in 1830 and they really had to debate what to do because they were concerned that they were about to be removed again from Wisconsin to west of the Mississippi River. And there was a debate um, is it better to maintain tribal status and remove again? Is it better to abolish tribal status and become US citizens? Would that protect their land better? And it was a very contentious debate. And part of that debate was, well, if Stockbridge people were to become US citizens, that would then mean that every part of their traditional tribal governance would go away, which included women's participation. And there were a lot of women who were opposed to gaining US citizenship, um, I suspect for these reasons. Um, and what's interesting is that they did eventually decide to petition for citizenship status. They gained that in 1843, they abolished the tribe, became US citizens, but they disliked being US citizens so much that within three years in 1846, they lobbied Congress to have that act repealed and they were successful in doing that. Thank you. Karen, who would you like to highlight? 
I would like to talk about um, Charlotta Gordon Piles, um, and she really exemplifies how um, African American women advocated for suffrage and abolition and other causes for the betterment of their community. But I think her story also highlights just the incredibly um, horrific circumstances that a lot of um, African American women found themselves in. So Charlotta Piles was born into slavery and um, in Kentucky. And when her owner died, he had willed Charlotta and her husband and their 12 children to his daughter, Frances. And um, the daughter, with the understanding that she would free them all, and the, the problem was, is that one of um, her owner's sons actually objected to this. So the, the daughter, Frances, then, uh, even though she was in her 80s, um, you know, went on the road to help move the um, Charlotta Piles' family into freedom. And they were headed to Minnesota when one of um, Charlotta's sons was actually kidnapped and forced back into slavery. But moreover, um, they were also not able to free two of Charlotta's sons-in-laws who remained in slavery. Um, the rest of the family successfully made it as far as Keokuk, Iowa, uh, and it was winter, so they didn't make it all the way to Minnesota as they had hoped to, and the whole family ended up settling in Iowa. And then Charlotta had to set about making a decision about what to do, uh, because one of her sons and two of her sons-in-law were still in slavery. So she set about to raise the money to purchase the freedom of, of some of her family members. And she went on the lecture circuit. So even though she was barely literate, African-American and indigenous um, and, and settled in a very strange area, she traveled throughout the Midwest on a lecture tour for both abolition and suffrage. And she raised $3,000, which is about $40,000 in current, um, in current uh, currency um, to free her sons-in-law because she wanted to free her sons-in-law so that they could support her daughters and their family and help the entire clan to do better. Uh, she had to tell her son that she was going to leave her son in slavery. So the very notion, the very idea that she had to choose between her sons-in-law and um, her own flesh and blood um, is, is a choice that I don't think any of us can even bear the thought of making. But moreover, it led to a rift between her and the son who remained in slavery, and they never heard from him again. So it's, it's a sad story, uh, but it's one that I think really highlights the really difficult choices that many African Americans had to face that many of us today simply cannot understand or appreciate. But yet she used that personal story in a very forceful way to advance the rights of, of African-American women in particular. Thanks, Karen. And now, Sarah, who would you like to tell us about? Well, I thought about this a long time because there are a number of women that I profile that all deserve attention and have not received it. Um, but I settled on a woman named Mary Corey. Um, she is from Clay County, Iowa, which is in Northwest Iowa. And she is an average ordinary woman um, she just lives in the capital or the county seat of Spencer, um, and she's just living her life pretty normally. Um, she joins the Federated Women's Club, and she becomes the chair of what's called the Village Improvement Committee, which eventually becomes the Civic Improvement Committee. And she's really spearheading a lot of these uh, activities that we think of with the Federated Women's Clubs, right? Um, the libraries, the beautification campaigns, sanitation campaigns, good pure food, all those sorts of things. Um, so she's not really expecting to be at the helm of a massive campaign until in 1915 uh, and then in 1916, Iowa faces its one and only amendment campaign um, to enfranchise women in that state. Um, and so she's elected to become the coordinator at the county level. And then she's also working within the district in Northwest Iowa. And so what's amazing is she actually runs what we would look at as a totally modern political campaign. She divides up the county into wards and then uh, and, and different townships. Um, and then she assigns different women to go out and canvas. 
Um, and she, in fact, I counted this up. There are 64 women that she is managing. She's connecting with them. She's delegating different tasks. And so it's just phenomenal when you look at the, the scale of this. The other side of this, and this is something that Karen talked about, how I was really reflecting what's going on nationally. Um, there had been a resurgence and in, in, in um, new tactics that people had been using. In particular, these were more public demonstrations. They were more provocative. Um, in Iowa, they weren't necessarily totally provocative, but they did, in addition to the 1908 uh, parade in Boone, they had automobile tours. Um, and in Clay County, they also had open air meetings. Um, this sounds like, okay, you just met outside, but it's actually really a big deal because for women to speak to a mixed audience outside, anyone could show up. Um, you could be, in fact, accused of being um, disorderly or improper or not respectable. And for a lot of women like Mary Corey, uh, staining your reputation was a really big deal. It actually speaks to how controversial, even in 1916, women's suffrage was. And so she is doing all of this at the same time that she's preparing to attend the National Convention of the Gen General Federation of Women's Clubs. She's um, running a successful household. So you just sort of think about how this ordinary woman is put in this position and really rises to the occasion. Um, and so even though the amendment campaign fails in Iowa, I think Mary Corey is an example of how ordinary women, when placed in these situations can really demonstrate um, how they can, in fact, be politically savvy and were politically savvy. Um, I'll just mention, too, the 1916 campaign, Mary Corey was one of a few suffragists who was more hesitant to label Germans as the reason why the campaign failed. Most women in the Iowa Equal Suffrage Association were more than happy to say that the reason the amendment did not pass was because Germans predominantly voted against it. The reality is that most Iowans voted against it, although it was a very razor thin margin of, of defeat. Um, so you can also see local activists who are struggling with that nativist approach and they provide more contextualization of, again, the complexity that we see within the women's suffrage movement. Great, thank you. Well, with the time that we have left, I'm gonna ask each of you to share some final thoughts um, perhaps something you didn't have a chance to share with us before, but uh, what would you like to leave with with today? And Karen, I'm going to start with you. So here we are with the centennial and we're in another presidential election. This will be the 26th presidential election where women have the franchise. And uh, what we have seen is that in the last you know, 50 years or so, women's voter turnout has caught up to or exceeded that of men. And in 2016, there were 10 million more women who cast votes than did men. So women you know, now engage fully and enthusiastically in this form of political participation, which I know would make suffragists really, really pleased. And Sarah, what do you have to add? I think Karen is exactly right that we have a lot to celebrate and commemorate and recognize the position of women and especially exercising the right to vote is something that I think we see. Um, I'm always struck at um, how much more we still want to see um, on behalf of women's rights. Um, I am sitting in my office surrounded by um, little kids toys because for the last six months my children have been coming to work with me um, and it's not necessarily uh, the fault of other people right different pandemic related issues but nevertheless I think that we see the disproportionate burden that's placed on women especially working women and then also women of color facing this even more predominantly we're seeing um, I think the recognition not only that women have a voice but um, elevating their status in terms of employment, in terms of healthcare, in terms of their political and legal status. Um, and I'm heartened by the conversations that we're having in this election moment, thinking about not only a, a single issue, but a complex plethora of issues that all intersect really uh, in important ways. And so um, as I sit here, that's really what strikes me as something that I'd wanna share and continue to talk about, the ways in which we can think about activism in a broad, with a broad set of reforms that we might seek to pursue. And Callie, what are your favorite final thoughts? Well, a lot of mine are gonna echo what Sarah was just saying. Um, you know, as we go out and we go to the polls and exercise our right to vote, I think it's really important to be active 
in the work toward equality of women who are maybe unlike ourselves or come from different backgrounds. And coalition building can be incredibly powerful, um, but it isn't as powerful and it doesn't really work if we don't really understand the issues that other women face. And we can't understand those issues unless we take the time to learn and to listen. Um, so I would just sort of leave everybody with that um, in terms of uh, maintaining uh, the work toward equality. Thank you. And I want to thank all of the panelists for sharing your expertise. And I want to thank the organizations who sponsored this event. And thanks to everyone for joining us as we have explored the role of the variety of women from so many backgrounds who paved the way for all women today. Thank you. Mm -hmm.